I don't want any penny from the taxpayers in Canada. Hassan Diab was remarkably composed when he returned to Canada in January, given that he'd spent more than three years in prison for no good reason. France called him a terrorist, and Canada approved his extradition based on flimsy evidence. Now CBC News has learned a Canadian government lawyer went to great lengths to bolster France's crumbling case and seal Diab's fate. We broke that story today, and it has already sparked reaction. I have read the reports of the involvement of government officials in his extradition. This happened under the previous Harper government. And I think that this is indeed a matter which it is important to look into. You're about to see why Diab's case now merits the attention of a minister. The CBC's David Cochran dug deep for the damning evidence. Here's his exclusive report now on Canada's role in the exile of an Ottawa man. Hassan Diab is making up for lost time. Three years and two months spent in a French jail in near solitary confinement. Each day taken from him by France and Canada. He's learning to be a dad to a little girl who grew up while he was in jail. Getting to know a little boy born while he was behind bars. It was the most difficult period. And then you have one birthday after another. His first, his second. Her second, her third, her fourth, and her fifth. I miss them all. What more can you lose? If you lose these things, there's nothing left in life. France has spent decades hunting Hassan Diab for a crime that still haunts that country. An explosion on this street, targeting this building. And French courts now say they got the wrong man. The crime was this 1980 bombing outside a Paris synagogue that killed four and injured dozens. The French case was built around contradictory eyewitness descriptions and secret intelligence obtained from unnamed sources. The only physical evidence was handwriting analysis from two French experts that linked Diab's writing to the bombers. This was later revealed to be deeply flawed. But Diab was still sent to France's largest prison. He spent 38 months in his cell alone for more than 20 hours a day without ever being charged. How are you not consumed with anger? If I get angry, really, what will happen? I think I will kill myself, like just like that. What can you do? What else? There's nothing else. Do you commit suicide? No, because you have... You know, these wonderful guys and the family and the kids and... Uh, do you solve anything? And the answer was constantly no. Don Bain has been Diab's lawyer on this case for 10 years. Nine of them without billing Diab a single dime. I, I would say of this case, it's clearly the most heart-wrenching in terms of what I saw it doing to Dr. Dieb's family. And this is storeroom number two of three. Bain thought he knew everything about this case, but even now there are surprises, like this memo obtained by CBC News. This letter 
or, and or its contents was never disclosed to us, the defense, or to the court. The memo reveals for the first time the steps Canada took to make sure Diab was extradited to France. A secret process started in 2009. Bain had successfully impeached the French handwriting evidence. Defense experts proved the comparison samples weren't even written by Diab. The French case was falling apart. So Claude Lefrancois, the senior government lawyer handling the case for Canada, wrote France, warning that significant evidence required for extradition would be lost. Lefrancois asked for two things to save the case a new handwriting analysis using proper samples on short notice, and fingerprints of the bomber to compare with Diab's that Lefrancois said could be extremely persuasive and perhaps conclusive. My first reaction is, is that Canada's role? Should the Department of Justice be doing this? This is France's case. Canada has no case against Dr. Diab, never did. If the French case is manifestly unreliable, seriously defective, falling apart, as you say, so be it. We're not, Canada's not the investigators for France. But finding case-saving evidence takes time. So Lefrancois obtained an adjournment, then repeatedly told the court he had no knowledge of what France was doing. In March, four months after he sent that memo, Lefrancois told the judge, I can't describe the nature of the evidence. It's somewhat useless to guess. I'm afraid we're at a loss. Well, France is not the only one who knows. The Department of Justice lawyer knows because he directed it. Canada knows. Canada knows, and they know specifically what it is. It's being done at their behest. Did the Canadian Department of Justice lawyer lie to the court? The transcripts speak for themselves. Six months after Lefrancois sent his memo, the key evidence arrived. In May, the tainted handwriting evidence was withdrawn, a new analysis that also suggested Diab's writing matched the Paris bombers was presented to the court. The prosecution called this evidence its smoking gun, even though the defense handwriting experts tore it apart. But under Canada's extradition laws, any evidence submitted by France has to be considered reliable, which made the prosecution's smoking gun legally bulletproof. And based on that, the judge ordered Diab's extradition to France, even though he called the French case weak and warned it was unlikely to lead to a conviction. What the court never saw was the fingerprint comparison Lefrancois asked for. The evidence he wrote could be extremely persuasive and perhaps conclusive. And it was conclusive. Every identifiable fingerprint on that statement excluded Dr. Diab. It was not him. It was conclusive. That was never told to the court. Conclusive, but it pointed to Diab's innocence. Under Canada's extradition law, they only have to present evidence of guilt. Which also means the court never heard Diab's alibi. On the day the Paris bomb went off, he was in Beirut writing exams. University records confirm this, but in an extradition hearing, the accused is not allowed to call evidence. You are allowed as a prosecutor to cherry pick. You can just take the exculpatory evidences and throw them away and put anything looks like inculpatory. And you, of course you win. That's all the thing that takes spots of a dress is a wall. Then we saw it was Canada and France against one man. It took him from his family. It took more than his liberty. I lost uh, all incomes, some savings, evaporated during the process. He's 64, he's jobless, but he has no plans to sue. Money for me doesn't mean a lot, especially after this long ordeal. And uh, a day with the kids is worth more than all the money they could give me, these people. Just 
one day with the kids is more, more than all their money. Le Francois, the lawyer in question here, did not respond to multiple requests for an interview. But in a statement, a Department of Justice spokesperson said it is normal practice for Canadian government lawyers like Le Francois to provide extradition requesting states such as France in this case with advice on how to strengthen their case. The spokesperson said Canada doesn't disclose confidential communications with its foreign partners to the court.